The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, bringing you the second lecture in my series of score analysis videos covering the finale of Berlioz's Symphony Fantastique, though of course this is actually the 23rd video overall. Thanks again to all my viewers for their patience over the past year as I had to deal with several other issues before completing this series. But late October seems a perfect time to launch these last few lectures as the topic is very Halloweenish in a way. Despite all the gruesome and fearful connotations of Berlioz's program notes depicting a black mass held over his grave, there's actually a sense of mischief and playful wit. It's almost as if the more serious and dire the narrative of the entire Symphonie Fantastique, the deeper the sense of irony. You can also read this in Berlioz's autobiography the more out of control his life spins in the book, the more he lovingly seems to tease his former self's naivety and fits of passion. At the very least, the demons that frolic about in this symphony seem to be having a great deal of merry fun at the artist's expense. Even in this lecture, which mostly covers the incredibly serious, grave, dies irae section of the fifth movement, you'll still see little snippets of the Rondo theme attempting to burst out of the music from time to time, reacting to the solemnity with more of the carefree mockery we saw in the previous introductory section. In fact, that Rondo theme is based on the E-Day fix that we heard Demon Harriet desecrate with the assistance of the E-flat clarinet. So the whole movement, despite all these very dramatic sidetracks, really is tied together thematically. We left off with a little simmering G major chord and tremolo strings, with Berlioz delaying the anticipated move to C minor that he set up very powerfully before, to the point where the music attempts to break free and make G the tonal center in these upward-ripping first violins and violas, right into a premature statement of the rondo theme, as I mentioned before. but the lower strings and A4 bassoons aren't going to let them get away so easily. In fact, they're going to drag the music down inexorably to the very pits of damnation, or C minor, however you want to think about it. Here we see the benefits to keeping the basses up in those big tutti passages leading to this point. Once the lower strings and bassoons do descend all the way down to their lower register, the depths feel truly profound. The harmonic implications are also simple but very effective, contrasting the sprightly G major of the upper strings with an answer that traces the outline of an A-flat major chord, a reversal of the chord change in the previous screen, and then descending over the notes of an F minor ninth chord, essentially just a C minor chord stacked on an F minor chord in the ear of the listener. Then the line descends chromatically to D and holds it there for an unbearable three bars, before finally reaching the promised completion on C. Berlioz sneaks in a telescoping of the parts in the sixth bar, where the basses jump up an octave to play in unison with the cellos and bassoons. It's such a subtle shift as to create the impression in the listener of a virtually limitless range to the low register of the lower strings, though I'm sure Berlioz would happily welcome the idea of maintaining the octave relationship all the way down to C1, if his bassists had C extensions or five string basses.
And now for the final introduction of a special instrumental guest to the fabric of Symphony Fantastique, orchestral bells, which are now such a mainstay that they barely raise an eyebrow in a modern concert work. For Berlioz's premier audience, they were like a hammer blow to their artistic consciousness, not to mention emotionally devastating in the context of their cultural and religious sensibilities. The more accurately the orchestra could produce the exact sound of church bells, the better they could wrap the listeners of that time into Berlioz's overwhelming vision. Let's hear how it's approached by the orchestra of the Franz Liszt School of Music at Weimar, whose 2016 performance has provided the reference audio for this entire series of lectures. Here, the percussionist is playing two pairs of tubular bells tuned to C and G. Pairing up the bells like this gives each note a bigger, slightly detuned sound. It's interesting how the third, softer statement on bells feels considerably further away, adding a feeling of space and distance to the music. Let's jump back to our vision of the premier audience, overwhelmed by the tolling of backstage bells, a sound that would have seemed to come from all around them rather than just the stage. That would be just the beginning of the unsettling sensation. Imagine how it would have felt to hear the next page of score, with A2 Ophoclides and A4 bassoons all bellowing along to the solemn tune of the Dies Irae. They would have felt as if they were witnessing an act of musical damnation. I'd guess that Berlioz's dissatisfaction with the serpent would have been felt most keenly in this passage. There are serpent specialists who perform this passage quite well alongside a period-perfect Ophoclide in today's reconstruction performances, but apparently the serpentists of Berlioz's time were far less convincing. Today's tubas are probably more in line with what he wanted in the first place, and it's an intriguing color to place them above the bassoons, rather than in unison or to have them below and the bassoons on top. It's great how the bells are one bar early in the phrasing, providing more interest than if they were playing right in line with the proceedings. <laughs> statement was about as rhythmically and harmonically simple as you could get. One octave melody note per bar, with no accompaniment except for the ones and fives tolling in the bells. Now Berlioz double times the dies irae in horns and trombones as a chorale, but still keeping it as simple stacked thirds, which you can see in the diagram of the first chord. Horns doubling E flat thirds, with alto trombone doubling that lower E flat, and tenor trombones playing those same thirds an octave below. This is followed by a further compression of the melody as a jaunty little jig in upper winds and pizzicato upper strings. I've diagrammed the first chord here as well. Notice the voicing of the strings first, with first violins on that high E flat, and second violins and violas in a G octave below. Berlioz is outlining the vertical scope of the woodwinds, giving the impression that the strings are plucking along to every pitch in a very economical way. But it's all a carefully calculated illusion, as some of his best scoring can be. The violas aren't actually doubling any woodwind pitch, but simply playing in a register where their plucked strings will be longer and more resonant. Meanwhile, the winds are playing merrily along with piccolo and E-flat clarinet doubling the first violins on top, 
flute, first oboe, and C clarinet doubling the second violins, and second oboe doubling the top E flat at the octave below, just to fill in the harmony a little more effectively. Notice that Berlioz gives his string players a fraction of a second to place their bows for this upward shoving return to arco on a C major scale. Even on this little completion to the phrase, the scoring is carefully placed, with piccolo on top, both violin groups and the rest of the winds sharing most of the weight in the middle, and the violas pushing from below. This results in a fiercely direct sound, with lower strings adding a stomp from below. This is a categorical example of how the natural energy of bowing can be used to its best effect. This upward racing crescendo is perfectly built for an emphatic upbow. Now the A4 bassoons and A2 ophiclides resume their dismal incantation in the same octave relationship, going into the next section of the dies irae. The climbing notes at the beginning help to underline the unusual tactic of putting ophoclides, or in the case of our audio track tubas, on top and bassoons on the bottom. There's a sort of throaty, plaintive grind to those first four bars, while the tiptoeing lower string pizzicato adds a layer of dastardly sneakiness to the ongoing passage, all while accompanied by bells coming in two bars late this time. get really interesting in the following brass chorale, double timing and harmonizing the same stark melody just as before. Don't let the transpositions and natural brass compromises confuse your eye if you're still developing your chops as a score reader. Just focus on your tenor clef reading to begin with, in absorbing the top line of the chorale in alto trombone. As you'll see, all it is is the same melody we just heard up an octave from where the ophoclides played it, with the second tenor trombone tracking the same line from an octave below, and the first tenor trombone harmonizing in the middle. Using that basic guide, you can see how all the other parts slot in around this, the top E-flat horn player doubling alto trombone, with the second horn part playing a lot of the same pitches as the first tenor trombone line, but also sharing a note with the alto and then a few notes with the second tenor trombone close to the end. And of course, if you remember your octave transposition for C horns, then you'll see they're also sharing a lot of pitches with all three trombones, as well as filling in some holes in the harmony here and there. That just leaves the E-flat trumpets playing whatever pitches fall across their natural range. The trumpets of that time would always be far more limited than the horns, so they couldn't hand-stop tones outside the harmonic spectrum in the same way. The result is a lot of sounding G-sixths, B-flats, Fs, and G-octaves. The answering gig is set up more or less the same as before, with pizzicato strings and a closer, more integrated harmony similar to the brass we just studied including some very cool voice crossings by viola over the second violin line. The violins will be doubling notes played by oboes and clarinets, with piccolo and flute doubling the essentials of the harmonization an octave higher. And again, an upward thrusting scale finishes off the phrase, but this time in G major rather than C. Berlioz really has no other choice than to finish the rest of the dies irae, after dragging the audience along with him thus far. And as there's a great deal of melodic recycling going on, he has to add on more and more textural and functional interest. This is one of my favorite parts, with the ophoclides and bassoons trudging deliberately onwards, accompanied by the heaving tenuto strings and bass drum. The dynamic contours of the strings starting with a big push but tailing off immediately into a mezzo forte drum stroke always reminds me of hoisting sacks of cement into the back of a pickup truck.
vocalization in the brass is pretty much the same as the first time, with horns and alto trombones sharing thirds above, and tenor trombones tracking those same thirds from an octave below. For added weight, the trumpets throw in quite a few sounding E-flat octaves, and even a few sounding Fs and a G. This G is shared across the range of all the instruments, a nice unison octave thrown into the middle of the harmony. Similarly, the pizzicato strings are arrayed as they were at the start of the dies irae, with clarinets and second oboe in the same relationship as before, but piccolo, flute, and first oboe take this whole harmony up another octave, evoking a very squeaky choir of imps. Notice a few changes at the end, the entrance of a rolled bass drum providing the downbeat, with the cellos joining the upper strings, ripping upward from a rest, in a harmonized scale this time, joined halfway by the winds, and then finished off with a brass chord underpinned by double basses. Let's finish this lecture with a run-through of all the music we've been studying from the premature statement of the rondo theme, to the entrance of the bells, all the way to the end of the dies irae section. As you read along, think about how, even though this music is very lightly scored, it's still tremendously effective and impactful. And of course, as this is Berlioz on a roll, it takes up just as much time as it wants to. But even at that, there's an awareness of the need to progress the texture and functions of the music wherever possible, to keep it from getting stale. And then I'll just leave you with thanks once again to my faithful supporters on Patreon for making this all possible and inspiring me to find new ways of looking at old masterpieces, bringing the freshness of these works back to life for all of our viewers. See you very soon for the next video. The Rondo is about to start.